Well, while we're waiting for people to join us, um, I want to welcome you to Clinicians for Planetary Health. We're an um, initiative of the Planetary Health Alliance, and we have been um, formed since um, or around since about 2019. My name is Teddy Potter, and it's my great honor to be chair of Clinicians for Planetary Health. And we're a group of folks from all over the world who, to to some, we have some connection with healthcare um, in our professional lives. And it has been our wonderful, wonderful joy to get to know each other and get um, gain great hope. Um, uh, from being connected and the work that's being done around the globe. So if you want to become part of Clinicians for Planetary Health, you can go on to our website or our webpage at the Planetary Health Alliance and sign up, and then you will receive messages about all of the events that we host. And so it is um, my privilege and honor to turn it over to, um, I believe, Nathan, who is going to maybe um, help guide this the, the dialogue today. But know that whatever brought you here, you are uh, immensely welcome, and you are now part of a global movement um, to bring health um, uh, uh, to a healthier place. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. And greetings to everyone from Kenya. So we say welcome to all. I am happy to connect with you all and looking forward to a wonderful call. I will hand it over next to Melvin, who is uh, also uh, in many different parts of the Planetary Health Alliance and is the founder of the Planetary Health East Africa Hub and is one of the leaders also for the ambassador program. So welcome, Melvin, uh, to share more about those initiatives of the Planetary Health Alliance. Thank you so much, Nathan. Hi, everyone. I'm Melvin Otieno, and I would just like to share with you about the Planetary Health Campus Ambassador Program. So this uh, Planetary Health Campus Ambassador Program recognizes next generation leaders of planetary health on academic campuses within international planetary health community at large. They have an opportunity to do activities related to planetary health, uh, at the same time engaging the communities and policy makers in their activities. And some of the benefits that the students uh, get from this uh, are immense. They have an opportunity to, to be recognized as champions for planetary health in their communities, while also developing uh, and building their leadership and organizational skills. And then we also see that uh, they are they play uh, in the uh, in becoming a, a part of the broader planetary health network uh, in terms of based on their other interests and uh, academic interest, age and nationality. So this move uh, this program started uh, in 2019. We had around six campus ambassadors worldwide, and up to date uh, this year's cohort, we are we have around. 122 campus ambassadors worldwide. So criteria for applying for this, you have to be uh, a, a, a current and a graduate or graduate student uh, interested in planetary health, and you must be enrolled uh, for a duration of uh, your term January to December. And then it, there are an opportunity for you to renew if you still wanted to finish your projects. And then it requires students from all disciplines and geographies uh, that are always encouraged to apply. It doesn't necessarily require a student who is uh, specializing in environmental health alone, but from different disciplines. And then they are required to submit this um, as an individual cohort. Aside from that, I'll share a link for further details about that. And uh, this year, it was really amazing now that we had a lot of campus ambassadors worldwide we initiated some of activities like campaign program, and we normally have also social hour events whereby they share what kind of activities they've done. And at the same time, we always have speaker series whereby we invite uh, uh, speakers from different uh, uh, backgrounds who have expertise in planetary health to share with them their experiences and so on. So aside from that, I'll talk about uh, briefly about the planetary health uh, um, regional hubs. So we have around 10 regional hubs of the Planetary Health Alliance uh, from different continents. We have the Sub-Saharan Africa hub, and with this we have two, two, uh, two uh, hubs, that is the West Africa hub and the East Africa hub, which are active at the moment. And then we have also the Middle East and North Africa um, 
that is not in actively engaged, but we hope uh, as time goes by, they will be actively engaged. And we also have the European hub, Central and West Asia hub, Southeast and South Asia hub, and also have the Oceania, Latin America, North America, and Caribbean. So with these uh, regional hubs, you are able uh, to access a global network of individuals and organizations uh, in order to share knowledge via in-person or through virtual convenience. And uh, these are organized separately depending on which hub you're coming from. And then we also have to, they also make use of the learning resources from the Planetary Health Alliance itself. So some of the expected activities that are, are from these different regional hubs is to host uh, virtual and in-person regional workshops and events and also provide uh, forums for sharing resources and also best practices and opportunities and also leading public outreach efforts. And also we encourage them to work with the local governments, especially in terms of policy and also engage with the local businesses. And aside from that, because it started off some, some hubs like the Eastern African hub, uh, its network has been based more on universities. So we, we encourage also more of creating educational resources and opportunities to be to be shared. Thank you so much. And uh, I welcome the next speaker. Uh, Vanessa, uh, together with Melvin, is someone who is passionately enmeshed in the planetary health ecosystem and soil and is really uh, someone who believes in movements personally all the way to the scale of the planet and embodying the health internally and externally. So we're working to network and weave together these different initiatives of the Planetary Health Alliance that Malvin just spoke about, the ambassador program, the hubs, and us together with clinicians for planetary health. So for anyone who is new on the call today, please know that this is a community of friends and we're united by our love for uh, ourselves and for our planet. So I'll pass it over to you, Vanessa. Uh, we are going to transition to our amazing lineup of speakers and uh, over to you, Vanessa, to get us uh, moving forward with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan, and welcome you all. It's a great pleasure. I'm Vanessa Goyes, and it's a great pleasure to be here um, with this movement that we are starting. It's a very symbolic event. We are bridging knowledges, wisdom, territories, silos, and everything. It's just a start. Um, so I have the honor to introduce our next speaker. Uh, his name is uh, Mr. Kaluki Po Mutuku. Uh, he is uh, a climate justice and environmental defender from Kenya. Uh, he has led and advocated for strong climate action in Kenya. Africa, from the successful the colonized campaign to leading education for sustainable development for schools, training and advocating for nature-based solutions and championing for sustainable diets, restoration, agroforestry, and ecological farming practices. Kaluki has a background in environmental conservation and natural resource management from the University of Nairobi. He is the Africa Director of Youth for Nature, co-founder of its Executive Director at Kenya Environmental Action Network, founder of Green Treasures Farms, and he advocates for strong and meaningful youth engagement in climate policy processes, leadership, and community engagement. So a very welcome, warm welcome, Mr. Kaluki. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I so appreciate the kind introduction. Um, I think I just go right into it, um, just expanding on, you know, do linkages between youth, um, a climate action and the health nexus. So it's rightfully introduced by Vanessa. I'm, I'm Kaluki Paul, and um, we engage um, closely in Kenya with Nathan and uh, Nathan Girl. Um, and first, I must appreciate to Nathan and Nathan Girl for invitation and of course this coalition for extending the invitation to me and Kenya Environmental Action Network which will exist mostly to bring together environmental and climate enthusiasts in Kenya also beyond 
to discuss matters and issues on climate change, uh, gender, food uh, systems, and the connections on um, how best we can lead on lifestyles that um, take us uh, from the point of a climate crisis to climate action and the solutions that uh, we want. Um, Keen was set up in 2020 and some of our programs uh, have been based on food systems. Actually, we do have um, um, Bustani, Bustani projects, which is a Swahili word for gardening. And we ideally engage communities and, uh, and learners on experiential learning on how best we can cultivate and grow uh, school gardens uh, for both vegetables and fruit trees, but also inculcating the culture of growing indigenous uh, trees that will help as a point of um, traditional knowledge and a point of um, research for the students and their communities. And I, uh, the beauty about our project is that the, the learners and the communities practically um, engage in setting up these uh, gardens and they manage them and they harvest them. And at the point of the harvest, they can decide uh, whether they want to cook the food or they want to sell so that they can get income for them and for their families. And for me, this project speaks to the testament that um, we need to practically engage communities from the point they are at, if it's on a point of food insecurity, and how do you come together to actually provide a solution by learning from them and with I'm sorry, say I think it was uh, just say like at times you find that uh, most people will assume that a community does not have a clue about climate action or food systems or water conservation, but actually through the lived a traditional and indigenous knowledge, these people know so much more privilege, but we do not know all the information that for and with delivering the uh, solutions um, for posterity in their communities. The other quick intervention I'll bring, bring to the table is the African Youth Caravan to COP27 that Keen, um, uh, you know, launched last year. And we sort of engage young Africans, farmers, women, and communities on serious climate policy uh, processes, training them, building their capacity, and really learning with them on what the key issues were last year, understanding that the COP27 uh, was um, happening in Africa. And I'm happy that Omnia is here to also give testament to that. And so we ran a whole African youth caravan to COP and from across Africa in, to really discuss the key uh, agency matters continent, energy transition, the question of youth action and really bringing together uh, our resilience systems and it, um, in the end, we were able to then take a delegation of up to 21 youth spread from all across Africa to number one, uh, be in Egypt for the climate negotiations to uh, inform and engage uh, other uh, constituents on um, what they're delivering the communities. And number three, uh, network and bring back um, some bit of hope to their communities and ways on where our collaboration might take us. And I'm happy to announce that um, I think through meeting Nathan and Nightingale and Anna Kofi um, back in February, if I'm not wrong, or, or April, sorry, in Mombasa, um, I'll, I'll, I'll confess that that was my first ever, you know, convergence uh, as a climate activist, meeting clinicians, pediatrics, and people who are dealing with the human body, human health. And for the first time, it actually clicked to me that wait a minute, I think we're speaking so much, but there's some disciplines that we are not, you know, putting at the center of these climate discussions. And the truth is um, healthcare professionals and people who deal with our bodies are the first people to even respond to some of the issues, uh, be it diseases, calamities, food starvation, when they happen. But most of the times we are not giving them the space to even lead, the space to talk, the space to influence the policies that impact our society. And so through this conference and as keen, we, we've been able to then learn a new perspective and you know, be open to more partnerships, you know, from a health perspective, healthcare professionals will deal with kids, with the children, and, and you know, even um, adults, and how synergies could look like when we listen to each other, when you create these knowledge sharing platforms for us to exchange our different um, knowledges, expertise, and, and of course, building on our backgrounds. So I would say um, it's a great opportunity for us and at Keen, we are very 
much ready to uh, explore the collaborations, support one another, and of course be strong advocates of uh, the climate uh, health nexus. And from a youth perspective, uh, we, we understand that Africa is the world's youngest population. And we cannot, there's no choice about it. Opportunity that if Africa is the world's youngest population, how do we discuss issues of biodiversity loss, issues of cl the climate crisis, and issues of health? Um, having young people as the agents of change and then collaborating with uh, different disciplines, including health professionals and practitioners, towards the solutions that uh, we wish to see. So that is a bit of uh, my story and what we are doing at Keen. And I'm happy to stay uh, here until the question and answer time. However, um, we are currently organizing for the Africa Youth Climate Assembly that is happening from tomorrow until Sunday uh, in the lead up to the Africa Climate Summit. And I'm also glad that Nathan and Nathan Gellan in Nairobi to participate in the same. And we look forward to really connecting with many of you and championing for the health climate. Thank you very much, Kaluki. Uh, you just said everything, right? Youth, uh, agriculture, community, gathering, movement uh, from the ground, food. That's the way. Um, I will, um, Nathan, would you like to say anything? Should we call our next um, lovely speaker? So I think just because Kaluki is really in the middle of lots of plans for the Africa Climate Week starting in a few days, he may not be able to stay until the end. We have the designated 10 minutes for question and answer for all of the speakers after all of the speakers have gone. But maybe if anyone has a question for Kaluki specifically, if you could put that in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute yourself. We could take a few minutes for questions for Kaluki. Perfect. So maybe we can move forward then. I haven't seen uh, any questions in the chat, but uh, feel free to post those questions in the chat uh, for Kaluki. And then we will. It's back to you, Vanessa. Okay. So thank you very much again, Kaluki. And we are now uh, gonna listen to um, Omnia El Omrani. This uh, is the first official youth envoy for the president. <laughs> Welcome uh, for the president of the 27th U Unit UN Climate Change Conference, COP27, and Egyptian Minister of Foreign Affairs. She is a climate change and health junior policy fellow at the Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College London. She's also a medical doctor with multiple roles as a commissioner at the Lancet Commissions on Sustainable Healthcare and Post-COVID Population Health, a member of the first youth sounding board of the European Union, DG Inter, and associate at Women Leaders for the Planetary Health and a member of the UNICEF AZ Youth Leaders Program. Omnia has attended the last four UN Climate Change Conference in Katowice, Madrid, and Glasgow, representing more than 1.3 million medical students worldwide in the International Federation of Medical Students Association, and in Egypt, representing youth globally. Fast Company MA, and we recognized her as one of the 35 most creative people in business in 2023. So Omnia, we need you. Just feel free. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, so much. And thank you for the wonderful invitation. Um, um, and I've always been closely following up since I was a a fifth year medical student, the clinicians for planetary health calls. So I'm very happy to be presenting in one. Um, I know we're very brief on time, so I will quickly share my screen. I have a very small PowerPoint that I wanted to share with you. Um, can you let me know if you see my screen? We can. Okay, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> 
let me open it up. Yeah, so I know today um, is a very special day because tomorrow marks the, the opening of the Africa Youth Summit followed by the Africa Climate Week. And um, what I would love to share uh, a bit around the perspectives of young people, but also the role and the efforts that are led by young healthcare professionals, particular, particularly in the African region. Um, as we know that this year was um, very significant when it comes to the acknowledgement of how climate change disproportionately affects the health of young people, particularly children and adolescents. It was for the first time recognized in the IPCC report, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this is the official report that the countries used to negotiate uh, during the climate change conferences. And this year, you can see in the graph above how it estimated uh, that the generations that if a person is born in 1950 compared to uh, people who are young people who are born in 2020 are going to see an increase in uh, temperature extremes that were never seen before, which of course leads to the many uh, health impacts that we as healthcare professionals see at the front line in the ER, as well as in the primary healthcare centers and the hospitals that we work in. You can also see in the second graph, uh, this was a report that was done by Save the Children, and it showed that if a person is born in 1960, they are going to, uh, compared to a person who was born in 2020, they are going to see from three to eight times the rate of extreme weather events that we are seeing from floods, hurricanes, wildfires, as well as drought. We know that in the African region, young people are over 200 million and young people in general are over 30% of the entire population. And we are hit the hardest when it comes to, first of all, air pollution. Nine out of 10 children breathe in polluted air. When it comes to acute food and water insecurity and how it leads to malnutrition, as well as one out of five children globally do not have access to the basic drinking water that they need. And we can also see how extreme weather events such as flooding, wildfires and hurricanes, they prevent uh, children and young people from accessing education, going to their school, going to the healthcare services that they need, as well as in the future, decent job opportunities, which are also impaired by the exacerbation of inequalities that climate change leads. And this really brings into perspective how our health as humans, particularly the health of young people, is dependent on the health of the planet, which sustains us. Um, but on the other hand, as young, particularly healthcare professionals, we have been working for many years to lead uh, and to really work uh, with uh, the planetary health crisis. And we do that in in different ways and in, a, in creative ways as well, either within our own universities or within our own healthcare facilities. So I'm here to share, to share a few examples of how young healthcare professionals are doing that. So one of the projects that I've worked with and we had the incredible support of the Planetary Health Alliance, for many years on, which was integrating planetary health and climate change in medical curriculum. We did a global survey that looked at 112 countries where we asked the medical students in each university whether they saw a mention of climate change or air pollution in their curriculum. And we discovered that less than 12% uh, of them had a mention of climate change. And this really helped us to present the case of how the medical students who are going to be the future health workforce, they are not well prepared uh, for uh, responding to the health impacts of climate change as they are the first line responders. They're not equipped with the knowledge nor with the understanding of the rising impacts of climate change, for example, increased rates of heat stroke, but also looking at increases in asthmatic attacks, direct injuries because of the extreme weather events, and many others. Um, and it really helped us drive a lot of mobilization within countries to start to integrate that into the curriculum. And I was very happy to see that Egypt, because we were also hosting COP last year, uh, my university and not just the medical faculty decided to work and design up a specific curriculum on climate change and planetary health and integrate that across all curricula uh, in, uh, in the faculties of the university. I know that other countries have done the same, for example, the Netherlands, Malaysia, I know Canada as well with a planetary report card and the US with a planetary 
report card as well and really students working on transforming their own education i also know that and saw um, a group of these incredible uh, healthcare professionals who are now prescribing nature to their patients in order to increase their mental health and well-being but at the same time uh, enable them and empower them to understand the interdependence of us as humans on nature and biodiversity and our responsibility uh, to protect it um, and then when we look, take a closer look in Africa, um, so I'm also working at Imperial College at the intersection of mental health and climate change. And we are now we are facilitating a series of dialogues to understand the needs and the impacts of climate change on mental health in each region. And we are developing a community of practice in each region. Right now we are mobilizing uh, both climate experts as well as mental health experts and healthcare professionals, bringing them together in two dialogues in sub-Saharan Africa to discuss and to understand what are the needs particularly of the most vulnerable communities and the people with lived experience of mental health challenges in the context of climate change to create not only a regional but a global research and action agenda for the intersection of mental health and climate change to bring in universities, funders, organizations and governments into this underprioritized and uh, least understood intersection, yet very important because of the increasing uh, prevalence of anxiety, the stress, as well as higher rates of suicide that is happening because of the high rates of drought, loss of income and loss of crops and loss of, of family members because of the planetary health crisis. Um, last but not least, when it comes to mitigation, there is a, an amazing organization called Build Health International, and they go to countries uh, that are that have been hit hard by climate related disasters and they go particularly to their healthcare facilities and they rebuild it in a way that is sustainable so they rebuild the hospitals they make them more resilient to such impacts but also environment friendly by installing solar panels by uh, integrating um waste uh, uh waste saving um and recycling principles within the facility in order to also save costs that can then go and can be reinvested in the provision of the quality healthcare uh, services. The last example is of a young Egyptian uh, girl and her sister who designed the first ever in Egypt uh, solar powered water heaters in order to uh, provide a clean source of heating the water for vulnerable communities in Cairo and other cities, and at the same time, reduce the impacts of air pollution on their health and really uh, save costs for them and save uh, electricity bills that they uh, use. Um, and then this is more around what we did in terms of the integration of climate change in curriculum, but also as students for many years, we go to COP, we advocate and we push for centering not just health, but also intergenerational equity and justice at the heart of the climate negotiations so that countries are not only delivering uh, for uh, sustainable development, but they're actually delivering for the health of the most affected people and delivering with them and in equal and uh, natural partnerships as uh, stakeholders. Um, just to quickly go through what we did at COP, particularly for the health outcomes. Uh, this year at COP, it was very important for us because it was the first time COP was held in seven years in Africa. We wanted to center the voices of the most affected African communities, particularly champion adaptation uh, that is very important for our region, as well as establishing the first ever loss and damage fund, which is a fund where, where which pushes developed countries to pay reparations for developing countries who least contributed to the carbon emissions. And at the same time, in the COP outcome decision, for the first time, we had the right to a healthy, safe, and clean environment integrated in the preamble of the COP uh, outcome, which was then adopted by over 190 countries at the end of the two weeks of the conference. And this was the first time this has been integrated in any political text since its adoption in June 2020 in the UN General Assembly. It was also for COP we really centered and 
we recognize the importance of the meaningful integration of youth-led perspectives, insights, and solutions. And we did that by appointing the first ever a youth envoy to a COP president, which is the position I was very fortunate to hold. And for the first time, we had a youth-led climate forum where we invited the negotiators and the ministers to speak with young people in the same roundtable, but giving the young climate leaders from all disciplines, including health, the floor first to voice their policy recommendations and asks, and then the policy actors would respond to young people's insights and um, demands. And finally, we had the first ever uh, children and youth pavilion, but we also had a dedicated health pavilion that was led by the World Health Organization, as you can see in the photo where there's a big lung, but it was so important because it really helped pave the way that this year, COP28 in the UAE is going to have the first ever health day, and it's going to have the first ever ministerial where they are going to invite ministers of health to come to COP for the first time and discuss climate and health solutions in each country and come up with a declaration that can then mandate and really elevate the political profile of climate and health at the heart of the climate negotiations and discussions. Uh, thank you so much and looking forward to your questions. Oh, thank you, Omnia, for such a rich and uh, informative presentation. Um, amazing. And to share this relevant work that you do, all that work. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank you, Nathan. I'll pass the word for it for Nathan now, but I would like to thank Nathan that was the one who gathered these amazing people here in this event. So uh, thank you very much for this, Nathan. And I will let you introduce our next lovely speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And just briefly to share about my connection with Vanessa, it really has Africa at the heart. And I think that is the case for so many of us who have ties to Africa, whether personally, physically, or spiritually, philosophically. Uh, Africa is a special place, to put it uh, very mildly. And we believe that Africa can be a global leader in showcasing how our health as human beings is fundamentally interconnected to the health of the environments and the health of our planets as our one shared home. So just to talk a little bit about the theme uh, for today's presentation, we have two speakers from Egypt and two from Kenya. And we started with youth, uh, with Kaluki and Omnia. And now we will uh, jump to Mona and Martin. And Egypt, as Omnia just highlighted, was the host for COP27 as the Africa COP. And Kenya will be the host to the Africa Climate Week. So we're doing our best to be a bridge uh, so that we have continuity to build on the amazing initiatives that Omnia just highlighted were uh, started in Egypt so that we can embrace those and even build those uh, into many other spaces. I did hear a rumor, Omnia, uh, maybe you can confirm if it's true or not that you might be on your way to Kenya or that you'll be here in person. So that will be an amazing representation of the Pan-African unity and the way that we are uh, really coming together uh, and having the African-led solutions that are uh, so important for Africa, but also for the world. So it's my privilege and honor uh, to introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Mona, uh, who Nightingale and I had the privilege of meeting just before we went to COP27 last year. And Mona has been working closely together with us in this planetary health space for several years now. We first met about two and a half years ago at a C4PH webinar that focused on children. So I'll go ahead and read her bio, but uh, it's really a special honor to uh, connect virtually. And we look forward to a time whenever all of us can be together physically uh, and build this friendship and love uh, outward. So Dr. Mona El-Sherbini is an accomplished medical doctor 
and Associate Professor of Medical Parasitology at the Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University, Egypt. She is the visionary founder and director of the Narrative Medicine and Planetary Health course at the integrated program of Qasr al Aini, IPKA, where she passionately integrates medicine with humanities, the arts, and culture while advancing planetary health education and awareness. Her distinguished contribution extends globally as an invited faculty member at the Nova Institute for Health in the USA. Additionally, she serves as a guest editor at the Challenges Journal, MDPI, Mona's proactive leadership in the grassroots initiative of the Africa Community of Planetary Partners for Health and Environment, ACOFI, and her visionary efforts led to the establishment of the Mentoring Research Network, MRN, a platform that facilitates collaboration and capacity building among diverse professionals researching pressing global public health challenges in Africa and beyond. Through her work, Mona seeks to nurture a pro-planetary mindset, positive mindset among both individuals and communities. She strives to cultivate a holistic approach towards a positive shared future for all. Her foundational principle, embrace holism with a focus on pedagogy before technology and humanity before science continues to inspire her vision and her passionate mentorship endeavors towards her colleagues and students alike. Karibuni sana, Rafiki Yangu. Welcome, my friends, Mona. Thank you so much, Nathan. It's such a, ple a, a pleasure and an honor to be among this lineup of wonderful speakers. And uh, I truly uh, learned a lot from Kaluki's experience uh, uh, by his practical work and the ever amazing uh, Omni and Omrani. It's not the first time to collaborate together. So uh, I'm so happy to, uh, to gather today uh, in this uh, meeting of Clinicians for Planetary Health and uh, be with me as I share my presentation. Thank you. It's such an honor and pleasure to be among this wonderful line of speakers and have this opportunity to share with you some perspectives that may inspire action in Africa's climate future and beyond. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Clinicians for Planetary Health event organizers and Teddy Potter for her continuous efforts in this space. I would also like to extend my thanks to Professor Susan Prescott for providing her artwork featured in this presentation. Before we delve into our journey, let's align our vision to embrace the interconnected challenges that we through our lives, from local to national, continental, and organizational frameworks. The 2022 IPCC Assessment Report beautifully articulates the need for an inner transformation towards sustainability. This transformation transcends the technical to the relational, addressing values and mindsets, and cultivating a profound connection with nature. To truly progress on the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs agenda, we must start within ourselves. Just as we navigate health systems and frameworks, we must navigate our inner SDGs our relationship with self, cognitive abilities, care for others and the world, and the catalyst for change that resides within us. Thus, our focus today is not just on recognizing the enormity of Africa's health and sustainability challenges, but rather on instilling hope into the very heart of this complex narrative. Our contribution to this cause begins locally. an undergraduate course for medical students at Cairo University, Egypt, narrative medicine and planetary health have initiated an inside-out transformative journey. This interdisciplinary approach empowers future physicians to understand patient stories, societal context, and environmental impacts on health down to the molecular level. Nurturing empathy, compassion, and holistic care that move beyond the human skeleton, the disease model, 
towards a broader vision of human flourishing and well-being. Beyond the confines of conventional mystical education, we celebrate the intellectual diversity of our students with an intergenerational acknowledgement. We provide a creative space with an unlimited format of submissions, ranging from scientific articles to expressive artwork and music, promoting self-development, creativity, and imagination to navigate personal and planetary health challenges at all scales. By equipping our medical students with this holistic perspective and opportunities, we are fostering a generation of physicians who are ready to tackle complex global challenges and learn from pioneers championing the climate agenda. It's within this intergenerational convergence of knowledge that the seeds of innovative solutions are sown. Our aspirations stretch beyond the borders, resonating with the collaborative spirit manifested through our partnership with the NOVA Institute for Health. Together, we are forging a synergistic exploration of all pathways illuminating the totality of health and well-being, amplifying the intersection of personal and planetary health, while promoting new narratives and ambitions in an era of interconnected challenges. Our commitment towards the African continent is central to all our endeavors, recognizing that Africa still accounts for less than 2% of the global research output. During the past two years, the Mentoring Research Network, MRN, within the Africa Community of Planetary Partners for Health and Environment, ACUFI, has built an initial leadership team with activities that employ an interdisciplinary, action-oriented, solutions-focused, future-directed, and hope-filled, organically-formed platform. We also harness traditional knowledge and acknowledge the rich heritage that defines our cultural tapestry with its indigenous beliefs, wisdom, and insights that mirror sustainable practices. By weaving these ancestral strands into our modern narrative, we demonstrate our commitment to forging a future that acknowledges the lessons of the past. As we stride towards a resilient future, I invite you to participate in transdisciplinary research at the intersection of personal and planetary health. Speaking in my capacity as guest editor in the Challenges Journal, I invite you to consider submission in the special issue addressing calls for cultural and spiritual transformations in the Anthropocene. The African climate future can be challenging but it's illuminated by our collective vision for a better world, with hope as our compass, unity as our guiding star, and optimism as our spirit. Let us remember that hope is not passive, it's an action, a driving force that propels us to take steps, no matter how small, while we hold hands and hearts embracing a hopeful tomorrow for Africa, for humanity, and for the world. In conclusion, we aspire to invest in cross-disciplinary knowledge exchange, honor our past ancestral knowledge and African indigenous traditions, and stimulate a range of future research ideas and inspirations that help us make a better sense of the world we live in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moana, for your amazing presentation. Winnie is just arriving in. Um, is there any any questions <laughs> or any comments before we move on? Um, my name is Peter Macharia, and I am now in Nairobi, Kenya. I am following closely the presentations, and I would say that uh, they are very much enriching. I would say thank you for arranging this meeting. One thing I wanted to ask is um, the place of... Uh, the African traditions and uh, 
in solving the climate challenges that you're having today as um, so much has changed. Or the, my question is whether the the, the, the way our age, our grand uh, our grandparents or our parents old parents were doing it, whether they were doing better than we are, or which there are some things that we can uh, we 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 can take from from our our ancestors, which can help to to save our environment. Uh, I think I, I can let Omnia go first uh, uh, because she uh, knows better about uh, climate solutions. And uh, from my point of view, I think that uh, sustainable practices, uh, many of them are uh, uh, like mirrored uh, with uh, some of the old uh, indigenous uh, traditions, uh, how they used to uh, take care of nature. So uh, perhaps I would let Omnia come first and then um, yeah, I will follow. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your um, for your kind remarks. Um, I think it's you know you mentioned something very important, which is you know how uh, the importance of us going back to our ancestors and to our elders, which is which is a very common tradition. Uh, particularly with indigenous communities where they come together in dialogues, bringing in the young people and the elders together to start to learn from each other and really think about what are the climate solutions. And it's important to see what we mean by climate solutions. So we know that for example, in Egypt, the temperature is increasing. We're going to face even more extreme heat every year. So we need to protect ourselves and we need to adapt to the increasing temperature. So we need to rethink about our infrastructure, our homes, our buildings. We need to think about um, the use of transport. We need to think about water, for example, water scarcity and food insecurity. How can we improve our agricultural practices? How can we use and save water when we are using particular crops? Uh, so really thinking about sustainable practices within different sectors. So whether it's the healthcare sector, so thinking about reducing waste and thinking about the agricultural sector, looking at the transport as well as industries and, and really thinking about and going back to what our ancestors and what mm -hmm. our communities who were protecting our lands are doing. And there's so much we need to learn from them, especially when it comes to our consumption, when it comes to our behavior, when it comes to how we see and value nature and how they do that and make sure that we are including them and not imposing solutions. And this is why it's important to have a dialogue where you bring in different stakeholders, particularly the ones that are on the ground, listen to them and think about together. And there's this there's this amazing organization called Health and Harmony, where they what they're doing is a, a lot about conservation, about restoring nature, about providing health services to those who cannot access the healthcare facilities that they need, particularly in settings such as in Madagascar, as well as other different countries. But they do that with a radical listening approach, which means that they only do solutions that their communities tells them to do. So they listen to them and understand how they see uh, the solutions and based on their inputs, they design solutions accordingly. So in a way, they're also empowering them to lead uh, solutions for for them and for their health. Okay, perfect. Um, very nice. Um, we Mona, would you mind to 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 speak at the end so Martin can present, and then we we keep going in this conversation. So um, I will call Nightingale to present our next speaker, um, please. And then we come back to this conversation. Thank you. Okay, so maybe she, I'll, so I'll do the presentation. Uh, so it's my honor and pleasure to present you Martin Muchanji. Um, he's the Director for Population Health and Environment and Leading Climate Change and Health Programming at AMREF. He holds a Master's Degree in Public Health and is a Doctor of Philosophy candidate studying in the same field. Martin has 17 years of professional experience in the public health, particularly in the African context. 
He has devoted his career to designing and implementing innovative fit for purpose public health programs in different contexts, uh, in different contexts of the continent. His expertise includes climate change, water sanitation, um, and hygiene, infectious diseases, control and implementation, science in the same fields. His recent work has involved testing various public health fin uh, financing models, uh, economic evaluation for public health programs, market research and evaluations on health-related quality of life. He is a management team member of international uh, the Intercontinental Finnish, which is Financial Inclusive, in, Inclusion, Improved Sanitation and Health, Mondial Program, member of the International Coalition for Tacoma Control, Neglected Tropical Diseases, um, NGO, um, and a member of various global working groups in climate change, WASH and NTDs. So prior to joining UNREF, Martin worked with Action Against Hunger, Madari in Switzerland, Beth in Kenya, and the government of Kenya as a public health officer, and in the Kenyan government serving in various positions and discipline forces. So welcome, um, Mr. Martin. It's a pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. Please confirm, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm in transit, so I'll not be able to turn on my video um, and pound on any kind of uh, background uh, noise. So as Vanessa introduced me, I work for Amre Field Africa. And uh, currently, we are deeply involved in climate change and health work. And that is what I would want to focus on for the purpose of this meeting. I would want to say that, uh, first of all, uh, it was very revealing because Amref participated in the first COP uh, last year in Egypt. And what came out was health was underrepresented. And that became the pain point and sort of uh, the, the 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 thing which made us to start engaging in a big way in two pronged kind of approaches which we are now pursuing. So I'll focus on two major things. The uh, basically speaking about the uh, the initiatives that are happening within AMREF and also uh, in Africa and to arrange extent um, globally, and that is around the uh, mainstreaming climate change into UNFCCC negotiations. That will be piece number one. And then piece number two, I'll focus on the work which is ongoing in terms of determining the kind of high impact solutions that the health sector is supposed to present within the uh, environment sector uh, so that we become competitive as, uh, uh, you know, for investment. So to begin with, uh, owing to the fact that climate change has been framed as an environmental issue, it happens that health drags behind. And if you look at the group analysis, you realize that there are very few countries which have moved forward to either develop the health national adaptation plan. And where they have been developed, most of them are not being implemented. The second piece is that there are very few countries which have been able to uh, put health as part of the nationally determined contribution. And these are the key indicators which the UNFCCC uses to monitor whether a country is doing well or not. Now, that, that said, um, the question arose, shall we then keep on complaining because that is what the health sector has been doing? The health sector has been complaining that climate change is impacting on both infectious and non-infectious diseases, and which is perfectly true. But without coming out and providing solutions, then that is going to continue. And we are going to draw ourselves within a corner uh, where nobody cares so much. And so working with 
a couple of stakeholders, WHO, Group of Climate Change and Health Alliance, Rockefeller Foundation, Welcome Trust, we decided to change for lunch and develop a concept around uh, pushing health to be mainstreamed within the UNFCCC negotiation and processes. And at the end of the day, what we aim at achieving is a health program within UNFCCC so that all of us who are sitting here and many others can discuss the science, can discuss the policies, can discuss the issues of financing in a space where we actually understand and are able to influence uh, uh, the, the UNFCCC processes. So for us to do that, we designed a couple of activities and I'll speak to them very quickly. The first one was awareness raising and we have done so very well in terms of holding a series of webinars. We have done Um, developing white papers, developing policy papers and briefs, which have actually started get, getting attention of the highest level, top government acron and decisions. And so the second piece was to ask ourselves, um, what is it that health stands for? And so for that case, African descendants to move forward and develop a Pan-African common position on climate change and health. That workshop was held last week in uh, Marawi, and I will speak to it because we decided to do this uh, in the run up to the events which are happening in Aropi, the, the Africa Climate Summit. We decided to do it in Marawi, bring it to Nairobi, have the ministers of health and environment sit and endorse it. And so, that common position has already been developed. The conversation which is out here is that we want this common position to be a group of perspective, not a Pan-African perspective. And so when coming to Nairobi, we are going to have two ministerial convening, ministers of health and environment sitting for Andina, first of all, to socialize themselves on how best they can work together. And then during the Africa Climate Summit itself, there will be a meeting between the African group of negotiators who naturally present themselves in the negotiation tables and the ministers discussing how best to move forward this common position, which is Pan-African, to become a group and gender. Above all, we are looking at how we are going to influence spaces in uh, the upcoming UNGA convening uh, and later uh, within uh, COP28. So that is largely the dot leadership visibility and policy influence work which we are changing. And then if you allow me to go quickly to the other piece which I spoke about, defining the best advice, defining the high impact solutions. Uh, and it is quite clear that the health sector is unable to go and get financing for actions which are related to climate change and health. And it is because we have not been able to frame our action in a manner that they are investable cases. And so to solve that challenge, um, a team of investors, the World Bank, uh, many civil societies have come together to define the best buys and to speak to what is it that can be sustainable be presented to the climate change community, speaking about uh, adaptation, adaptation and uh, mitigation imperatives. So uh, I think by the end of that exercise, it will be clearer about uh, what kind of uh, initiatives can be fronted, the investments that are needed, and we are going to see more or less of uh, the health sector coming up with uh, investments and uh, with initiatives which can then conjointly address climate change and health. Uh, so that I take questions uh, as needed. Thank you. So now I guess we'll move for the questions. So we'll, we'll have a uh, space to discuss more. Um, <laughs> yes, it's good to see this, um, this level of um, we becoming from community to the politics and starting to um, have this dialogue with, you know, 
uh, rules makers. It's a very important step for our movement. Um, so I think we'll, we'll pass, maybe Nathan, is Nathan here? We'll pass for the breakout rooms now to discuss a little bit more closer between us. Yeah, I think if we give a little bit more uh, collective time to questions and feedback for the speakers that are still with us, uh, then our plan will be to make it easier in a smaller group setting to get to know each other better. But maybe about uh, five or so minutes, uh, our initial plan was to finish right at uh, 90 minutes. I would propose if we could be a bit flexible on that hard endpoints, then I think we'll be able to do more uh, within the group and then also have the, the small group before concluding. So now is uh, a time for question and answer. I did drop off for a bit, so uh, we could uh, have anyone who's reviewed the chat to see if there have been questions that were posed, and we can also uh, request if you have a question, you can raise your hand. I had seen Dauda's hands uh, some time ago, um, so that's we can have that uh, dialogue amongst the audience to the presenters. Nathan, while people are thinking about their questions that they want to pose, uh, this session is being recorded and it will be sent out um, to everyone who is registered for this, this event. And so be expecting a, um, a query that is in a, a post um, session evaluation and then you'll be sent the recording. Thank you. I'm not sure if Mona would like to take uh, the conversation that we, we posed for Martin um, about the ancestors, this rescuing, this dialogue with our wisdom. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Vanessa, for this opportunity. And thank you, Peter, for your question. And uh, also I would build on what uh, uh, Dr. Omnia has already uh, mentioned. Uh, that there are a lot of ways to learn from uh, indigenous people and uh, learn from their uh, culture uh, that has been passed through from generation to generation and proved that is still working. Uh, uh, but first, we would like to um, uh, have this uh, uh, um, uh, foundational uh, knowledge about uh, uh, the, the definitions, you know, as Martin mentioned, what's health? and and uh, uh, why we have to challenge uh, uh, the modern curriculum, for example, in medicine, or uh, uh, we have to go like a multidisciplinary, uh, although uh, uh, the mainstream um, mood is like uh, uh, being a specialist in something or uh, or uh, the, the disciplinary uh, fashion is, is more uh, uh, credible, maybe. Uh, but then uh, we, we'll have to integrate all these um, uh, uh, you know, uh, tapestries of knowledge. Uh, this is the issue that we are all working in silos. And uh, Dr. Omnia also always uh, like uh, enforced the idea that intergenerational conversation is so much needed to solve the climate uh, agenda. Uh, and uh, I also believe that uh, this is um, very much like um, uh, not put into consideration. Um, uh, and so uh, it's not just the indigenous knowledge that is missing, uh, uh, but also the uh, the focus on uh, intergenerational voices and uh, also uh, the eroded traditions and uh, the spiritual aspect also. Uh, and today in the morning, I um, uh, I listened to an article that is uh, focusing on the missing pillar in sustainability. Uh, which is the uh, spiritual aspect. And I'm glad that together with Teddy Potter, we are in this constellation project. Uh, uh, and uh, it's very important that we start to navigate uh, uh, those uh, inner development goals uh, and to acknowledge uh, the wisdom of the elders and the wisdom of uh, uh, those that uh, were before us and uh, their uh, practices uh, proved to be sustainable and uh, eco-friendly also. Thank you very much. And back to you, Vanessa. 
Thank you for bringing the Constellation Project and spirituality in the conversation. Uh, very important and very related with rescuing our wisdom and connecting with um, our ancestrality. Uh, um, Dima uh, posted a question earlier uh, for Mona, uh, asking about the, the content uh, for the curriculum of the narrative medicine and the planetary health, if it is available to share, and if you could share that or to talk a little bit about this curriculum. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very important question uh, because I believe that uh, pedagogy should go before technology. And it's usually the case that uh, when we take any fellowship or any uh, certificate for medical education, uh, it usually gives you this style of how to deal with uh, uh, virtual platforms, how to uh, inject like uh, uh, this uh, uh, technical issues in education but it never focused on the curriculum, which is the big dilemma, actually. Uh, so uh, my contribution to uh, this uh, cause has been an extracurricular uh, program uh, that I was able to implement uh, since 2017, because it was so hard uh, to, um, you know, mesh into uh, the mainstream uh, educational program, especially at uh, Kasralaini, it's it's very old, uh, established 1827. So, you know, this uh, big um, foundations and institute is very hard to uh, to change. You know, so what I what I was able to do is uh, to take confirmation that I can uh, run my own uh, extracurricular program, which is dynamic actually, because every year I have to change the course specs of this. And uh, of course, as you know, it belongs to the place that I teach at. So it's not available online or anything, uh, but I can give you some insights as uh, some of uh, uh, the, the things that you saw already in the presentation. It's all about, um, you know, uh, how to deal with uh, student psyche and how to honor them and honor their voices and, and give them a creative space. And at the same time, make the assignment something that stands really for them, something that uh, it, it will bring out a lot of, of their um, imagination, creativity, vision, and so on. So uh, this is just like um, how I crystallize uh, why this program has been like um, uh, loved by many students. So they, they just uh, uh, apply for it uh, to have some fun, you know, and to have some opportunities also to interact with the a global community, not just uh, to be very uh, focused locally on medicine and, uh, you know, things that, uh, that that's not beyond the human skeleton. Uh, and also something else that uh, I want to focus on that um, the integration of uh, planetary health really helped a lot because uh, we have to see how environmental factors through um, uh, this expo exposome science, the microbiome science, the omics revolutions, and so on. There is a lot of updates in medicine that is missing, again, in the uh, main curriculum. And uh, 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 being uh, able to, uh, to um, uh, add this uh, in the extracurricular activities, something that really the students appreciated to understand that disease can be uh, you know, undone. And also we, we talk about the history of medicine something which is again missing in the curriculum. We, uh, students have to understand the history of medicine and this gives them a, a very good foundation to honor the indigenous wisdom and also uh, the traditional knowledge uh, because it happens like uh, they reject this kind of, um, of thinking. Uh, it, it's unusual uh, in modern science, but still um, uh, the planetary health principles helps a lot to uh, illuminate this very important missing aspect in the curriculum. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Mana. Um, I'm not sure if Martin is still here. Um, yes. I, so I guess not. We had a Dauda have uh, uh, yeah we had a question here for Martin uh, maybe we can post that in the high low uh, space and gather everybody there for 
keep going on this conversation. So I'm not sure if it was from Nightingale, this question. Um, we'll do like that. And uh, Dauda, uh, please, if I didn't mention, uh, said write your name, please correct me. Yeah, all right. I, I think that's correct <laughs> enough. I'll pardon you. It's Dauda, keep the vowels short. I think, um, I don't know if this would qualify to be a question, but I think it's more of a contribution. There is a missing component of this conversation that I'd like us to incorporate, which is livelihood. We have to bring on board sustainable livelihood because I'm into conservation. I'm a veterinary doctor. I'm a wildlife veterinarian presently. And I work at a very rural community where we have direct contact with um, indigenous people and we get to interact with them on a daily basis and understand more uh, their perspective to most of the the um the concepts that we are introducing to them and the things we want them to do with regards to conservation uh climate change and sustainability environmental sustainability so what comes up almost every time is how does these relate to livelihood and when you look at it biologically they are right because they are also seeking their own survival as well so if you ask them, for example, to preserve the environment, to preserve the forest. If that is the source of food, then you have to provide alternatives to them. Now, the alternatives are the things we should uh, make sure they are not detrimental to the environment. Because, yeah, of course, if you, a livestock production, for example, is a regenerative means of uh, livelihood that you can introduce to them. It depends. Then you tell them, you inform them, you educate them on how to make this livestock production or whatever species they want to produce. Um, to be sustainable and be environment friendly, friendly, such that they will mitigate the methane production. For example, those that want to go into cattle production or uh, large ruminant production, then you teach them methods, feeding methods that will help them reduce uh, methane production. So that's just an example of a scenario in which uh, we need to onboard sustainability. Yeah, and when you look at climate change, is it does multiple causes and of course multiple effects. So, um, it has an impact on almost every aspect of human life. And when you talk to people that have a, a significant that that are custodians of a significant portion of the forest and, um, yeah, the resources contained therein, they always bring up the question of sustainability, uh, livelihood. And yeah, in order for us to really bring everything together and make sure there's a balance, we are trying to mimic the ecosystem balance now that was established naturally in the time of the ancestors who want to replicate it. And if we are trying to do that, then we have to put almost everything into consideration. If we, you know, just stand at the interface between climate change and health, it may not be possible for us to achieve the long-term impacts that we um, are looking forward to. So if we incorporate sustainability, uh, I mean, sustainable livelihood specifically, uh, I think it would really, really, really go a long way in terms of implementing most of the policies that will be made up, whether at the interface between climate change and health or at the interface between climate change and, and livelihood. Yeah, that would just be my contribution. I think uh, I've seen this being you know, left out by some of the speakers and I would like to you know bring it on because practically, um, speaking from experience this summer, and, um, yeah, that is an issue that always come up. So it's something we also need to address. Thank you. Thank you, Dada, for your contribution. Um, yes, it's connected to lifestyle, right? Community lifestyle. We need to rethink all, uh, and definitely uh, to build up. Uh, um, the development with connected with sustainability. Otherwise, it's not really development, right? Um, that's what we are understanding now, as I guess. So, yes. Does anybody want to would like to comment on that or any uh, any comment? So thank you, Dauda, and thank you, Vanessa, for the great job facilitating 
just looking at the time and with the thought about how we can have more intimate conversations as smaller groups, I would propose, I think Nikki uh, can maybe break us into right around eight um, different uh, small groups. And maybe Vanessa, before we go uh, into the small groups, there were several uh, questions for, for the small group discussion. I don't know if you could post those again, uh, just basically uh, things that stood out from the presentations, uh, things that you're doing uh, in uh, your own life and work related to planetary health, and then ideas about how we can work together moving forward uh, to amplify the positive energy that we've felt today in the shared space. So that would be my suggestion. Welcome back, everyone. I, I know we maybe just had a chance to say hello and just a little bit about ourselves, uh, but we are trying to be mindful of time and to balance the energy that we have together with the needs that we have to remain engaged in the other responsibilities externally. So uh, we hope that this has been a taste of all the amazing activities and solutions that are happening in Africa and beyond in the planetary health space. Want to do a special appreciation to Dauda uh, representing the animal health and veterinary community and for raising that extremely important reminder that livelihoods uh, are important for us to remember as we think about ways to really ground planetary health discussions in topics that are close to home and close to the heart and mind for as many people around the world as possible so that we can diversify this space and make it so that we can actually transform the root causes for planetary disease and so many of the other challenges that we are facing. So in the remaining time that we have together in the call, we really wanted to have a dedicated space for looking ahead at next steps and action points. The goal of this call was to give a preview uh, for the climate week that's happening in Africa. Our plan is to share uh, with the community about updates of what is happening on a daily basis. And then we have other climate weeks that I'll post in the chats, uh, Middle East and North Africa, Latin America, and then Asia in the next couple of months, building up to COP28, where health will be elevated at the high level. And then the Planetary Health Annual Meeting uh, will be held in Malaysia from April 16th through the 19th of 2024. That'll be a great opportunity to connect with us uh, in person and get to know uh, a planetary family. So uh, I'll maybe see if uh, Nikki or uh, Saksham uh, has more to share about uh, next steps and we'll be doing our best to post a link in the chat. We do have a WhatsApp group uh, dedicated to carrying for this conversation. Uh, so thanks again to everyone and maybe over to Nikki. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. We want to keep this all rolling. So as we've mentioned, we have, there's a WhatsApp group in the chat. There's a Hilo group. We'll also be po posting the recording to YouTube. You can look for that on the uh, Coffee YouTube page once we get that up. But any thoughts that you had, didn't get a chance to contribute, um, don't leave them there. We'd love for you to share with them. Let us know uh, what you're doing as well. So. If Saksham is here from uh, the C4PH team, I invite his commentary as well. Um, I don't think I can add anything to what all was said. It was incredibly insightful. I'm just probably going to take this opportunity to underline the gravity. Um, after the pandemic, well, during the pandemic and throughout um, everything that has happened since 2020, there have been, well, Astonishing amounts of uh, casualties owing to the climate changes, heat waves, floods, disasters, earthquakes, you name it. So I think um, uh, while everything was, I mean, not while, um, everything that was said was incredibly relevant and incredibly important because um, we're going in times that are going to be incredibly adverse and we need to well bring in all of our resources to protect our planet. That's mm -hmm. all I have.
Great. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you around and we'll see you at the next one as well, we hope.